by torture machines. But are these accounts accurate? Ancient Discoveries has brought together a group of experts to test some of these devices to see how they really work. Our investigation begins with a physical examination of how tension can rip a body apart. For millennia, bodies have been stretched to inflict pain. This torture has been practiced in different ways, but always working on the same basic principle, to stretch a person until he or she breaks at their weakest point. There are historical accounts of how this strain acts on the body, but there's been little scientific evidence to support them until now. Traditionally, we regard joints as being the weakest part of the body because there's not bone across joints. Bone is visualized as being very hard and very resistant to uh, stress forces. Traditionally, if something's going to be ripped apart, it will be at a joint. But this may not always be true. What if ancient torturers designed a machine that applied tension to the body in such a way that it left joints undamaged and ripped bones apart instead? No self-respecting torture chamber would be complete without a rack. Um, it's uh, an absolutely ubiquitous item for persuasion. First used in ancient Greece, the rack has been popular for thousands of years. Torture was, was an accepted part of the legal system in ancient Greece. You weren't supposed to torture Greek citizens, but you could torture your slaves. Slaves in particularly ancient Greece were hardly considered human. Um, they're often described as tools. One author refers to slaves as just being man-footed things, that they aren't really men. Um, and it was thought that one of the only ways that you could get truth out of slaves was literally to pull the truth out of them. Historical accounts contain startling details of how the rack acted on the body. So cruelly racked at the pulleys that his limbs were forced apart at the joints. To see its effect on human bodies, Richard Windley has built a model of one of the earliest examples. Basically what we've got is a long ladder frame, which is two main long supports with cross pieces. The main sort of windlass device is this end. This is what actually produces the tension or, or the pulling. Now, one of the critical elements of, um, of this device is the use of this, what we call, ratchet and pawl system, and that's a kind of locking device. And the, the point of this is that one can increase the tension incrementally so that each little click of this thing is going to give just another level of pull and yet more discomfort to the poor unfortunate who's actually tied down on the rack. Richard is joined in his experiment by trauma surgeon Dr Mike Edwards. They hope to find out just what this slow build-up of tension does to the body. Richard and Mike are using a pig's leg to test the power of the rack. A pig's knee is a good substitute for a human knee because the joint's structures are of similar strength and position in both species. I'm sure that tension's being taken equally. There we go. Are we there? Yeah, I think we are. That's good. But when that goes... James Dean, a specialist in creating three-dimensional schematics, is using technology specifically designed for ancient discoveries investigation. This is a pig's knee, and if we take a look and remove the skin, we can see the structures underneath which hold the knee together. Uh, first of all, we can see the muscles, and on the bottom we have the hamstrings. And then back on top, we can see we have the quadriceps tendons which connect the muscles to the kneecap and then we also have the ligaments which are responsible for the bone to bone connections. Now if we simulate the rack and we start applying tension to the model you can see that first of all it's the muscles which are opposing this force and the muscle fibers are contracting and it's, it's trying to pull and hold the knee together. But if we keep on applying the tension we'll see that when we zoom in that the muscle is starting to give way, that the filaments of the muscle are, are tearing and the muscle itself is losing its ability to contract and hold the knee together and so we see the first signs of extension. Oh, 
Hold up. We've got movement here. We've got some creaking. We've got some creaking. Well, I think I think that one of the tendons has gone just here yeah. on the back of the knee joint. Yes, I thought it felt something crap. No, you did. Something definitely went there. I don't think there's going to be much further to go before it starts coming apart. I think probably we're finding that there's going to be there's certainly some stretch inside the knee. Now I just crank it up and let's keep going. So we've just seen that by continuing to apply tension to the knee, we have actually managed to rip the patella tendon out of its connection with the bone. Uh, and this has left the kneecap floating free. So if we zoom in and take a look, it's the sharpest fibers at the end of the tendon, which we can see here, which anchor the tendon into the bone, which have actually been ripped clean out of the bone. Now this area has got lots of blood vessels, it's got lots of nerve endings, so this injury is gonna be very painful and very bloody. And if we go back to the wider scale, we can see that the only thing that hasn't been injured by the, the tension in the knee so far has been the elastic components, which are the ligaments. So whilst they've been stretched, they haven't been injured. OK, slowly now. I can see it stretching. It's going. Yes, it's going. Hear that? Yes, it's, it's gone. gone. It's gone very easy now. That's it. Yeah. It's gone. It's gone. We can see the two halves. Oh, well, that's interesting. This isn't, this isn't what I expected at all. I thought the ligaments were going to go. But look what's happened. It's fractured. Is that the actual bone? Has... The bone has fractured. You've pulled apart the bone. Good gracious. The joint itself... Is, is still articulating. Is still articulating. But, but what, what you've done is you've pulled the bone off. Broken the bone. You've broken the bone with the, with the traction. The rack has pulled apart the bone and left the ligaments of the knee intact. This contradicts both the ancient accounts and modern expectations, because bone is believed to be a stronger material than ligament. But what if this is not true in all cases? Could it be the rack's incremental build-up of tension that accounts for this surprising result? As we continue to apply tension, we can see that finally, it's the bone itself which has pulled apart. And we can see that the growth plate, which is the area of the bone where new tissue forms, is the weakest part of the bone. And this is where the bone has actually ripped into two pieces. Because of the way in which the rack slowly increases tension, we can see that the elastic components, which are the ligaments, whilst they've been extended, they have survived effectively uninjured. The inelastic components in the joint, which are the tendon and the bone, have been ripped apart. This new insight into one of history's most common torture devices can be explained. Because ligaments are more elastic than bones, the gradual increase in tension stretches the ligaments but breaks the bones. If the rack had pulled suddenly, however, the ligaments would have snapped and the bone remained intact. Well, that was really interesting. It didn't go quite like I thought it would. I had expected the ligaments to go, but what we had was a fracture. So I think we've actually discovered something today. And when we thought before that we'd have just a ligament rupture, now we know that if we put somebody on a rack, then probably they're going to get fractures. To pull a bone apart with such apparent ease, that really changes my view on how the rack acts on the body. Meanwhile, in ancient Rome, an emperor devised a torture to entertain the crowds at the Colosseum. It was called the Tunica Molesta, and it turned the victim into a living fireball. In the ancient world, the masses were often entertained with displays of torture and death, and this was never truer than in the Roman games. These huge spectator events were put on in amphitheaters across the entire Roman Empire. We hear all kinds of accounts of very, very, very gruesome, very showy forms of torture being developed so that somebody can die an excruciating death in front of your eyes. One man who particularly enjoyed these ingenious new torments was the Emperor Nero. Among the Roman emperors, Nero stands out as kind of infamous for the, his use of uh, torture and public spectacles. He made them elaborate um, festivals of pain. Nero is remembered for one of the most spectacularly cruel tortures ever seen in the amphitheatres of Rome, 
a torture that turned a man into a human torch. An account written by the first century poet Lucilius describes a torture designed at the request of Emperor Nero. It was called the Tunica Molesta. The Tunica Molesta is a particularly unpleasant reenactment of the mythological death of Hercules. Hercules was tricked in myth into putting on a poisoned tunic. The poison burnt his flesh to the bone. The pain was so unbearable that Hercules set himself on fire. The Romans kind of act this out in the amphitheater, in which condemned criminals are forced to put on uh, a tunic impregnated with inflammable material, and then it's set fire to. How was this torture designed to maximize the spectacle for the audience? By creating an explosive and long-lasting fireball on a living human being. It is hard to say for certain exactly what the tunic of molesta would have looked like. It would have been a fabric uh, tunic, uh, probably linen, coated in flammable material. Pyrotechnic expert Scott McIntyre is investigating the flammable material that Nero might have used for the perfect human fireball. We're going to attempt to, to try and uh, maximize uh, the, the visual impact um, of having a burning garment. We could try out different materials to try and maximize that effect, get the flames as large as possible, to really try and just get as impressive a, a spectacle as possible. He will need to create fire on a linen tunic that ignites explosively with plenty of flames. The most easily ignited substance available was naphtha. It would have been around in Roman times. It's a very thin liquid, looks just like water, but uh, it contains uh, flammable uh, vapors that will be readily given off at this kind of temperature. Now that did ignite, possibly a little bit too quick because it's all gone. We did get an instant burst of flame there, but it didn't last very long. Uh, it was quite spectacular, but very, very short lived. There is an historic document, however, Fox's Book of Martyrs, that suggests how large, rapid flames and a long-lasting burn may have been achieved. He had some dressed in shirts made stiff with wax and set on fire in his gardens. Nero's technicians could have used a wax or paste. By thickening a flammable liquid into a paste, they would have been able to apply more of the fuel to the linen, resulting in a longer-lasting burn. I have a thickening agent here, uh, which hopefully mixed with naphtha will allow us to bulk it up so we can actually get a large body of fuel on the garment and then hopefully we can extend that burning time and still harness the same properties that we have, the instant ignition, big yellow flames. Straight away, you can see it's sticking very, very well. Wow, that ignites instantly. Hopefully should burn quite a lot longer. Yeah, there's a lot more fuel burning there. The flames are quite ferocious, and it's gone right the way through the material. Probably would have gone right through to the skin. It's uh, three, four times the length of the previous burn, and it's still plenty of fuel. You can still see it on there. Once you cover somebody in that gel, there's no escaping it. It sticks to things, and it burns, and they're just going to be one mobile fireball. Scott has designed the perfect tunica molester. But how would it...